Big Footy Port Adelaide podcast is proudly sponsored by New Vision. My team, Kanda, power. I love the power. power, power. I love the power. power, power. Well, we hit the, uh, hit the finals running. We played Nord in the qualifying final in front of 25,000 people at Footy Park. We led all day. Clive Waterhouse had a day out. So did Georgie Fiacci. Um, and Anthony, du- Anthony Darcy was just about best on ground, as he was in the other two finals as well. Um, but sadly, we lost David Brown and Daisy Borlase halfway through the second quarter um, to knee injuries, and both didn't play again for the rest of the year. Yeah, that was that was really um, sad because you know, Brownie and I are very close mates, and Daisy and I played in the Sapsaza team of under twelves in nineteen seventy eight together, so we've known wow. each other for ages. <laughs> and uh, Daisy had bone on bone and it was floating and it was getting caught and he tried everything possible to get up for that grand final up and to and including the last session we had and Jack just had to give him the sad news sorry mate I can't risk it and oh you've never seen a more devastated bloke it was uh, and that's the really sad thing about grand finals is you always have a tragedy a tragic story and you know unfortunately for Daisy he was he was it in 95 and and Brownie as well, which, yeah, two very good players. But you, you then look at the lineup and you go, oh, gee whiz, who's coming out? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it makes it hard, doesn't it? So that was the, that was the depth at, at the time. It's fantastic. And, of course, Tiles missed out and um, could could easily have played in Kirtley Ambrose, as you said. Um, I think he came yeah, in and, very and unlucky. With Roger and, and he missed out. And there were probably four blokes there hovering on the, the fringe of that side come selection. And it would have been a tough call. It would, it would have been tough to leave any of the guys out as well. Like Malakellis and Francis were sort of mentioned in the papers leading up to it. And they kept their spot. And, and there were, I think Roger was, was close to the only change. Yeah, you're right. And uh, it was a massive call. And, and Jack actually said to me, he said it was one of the hardest selection he's ever had to do was leave Ambrose out and put Delaney in. And uh, it was a big call. Roger had sort of only just got back with the helmet on, which we quite yeah. often bring a photo of out and show him. <laughs> <laughs> What he looked like. That was right in the yeah. middle of the gladiators crazy. He looked like oh, uh, one yeah. of the gladiators. He did. It was hilarious, and we never let him forget. <laughs> uh, so quite entertaining for us, but when you look at the games that he and Brian Lees played, I think at one, I think both players they stood had two touches, a kick and a handball, I think. You, you didn't notice Mark Conway till about the third quarter. You yeah, wouldn't have known he was he out there. Have, he either had Third one quarter or in 1998, touches. I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, it was amazing. Um, hey, Tim, uh, two quick, games. quick question for you. How, how, did, uh, how does a club handle that sort of situation where you've got an Ambrose that's very hard done by uh, and missing out on selection? And how do you usually see the players accept it? I remember when I... Missed out on the grand final at the Broadview uh, uh, Pool Club with the footy club uh, for the pool grand final, and I spat the dummy and cried for days. Uh, <laughs> you know, how, do, how does it go for you? How do you handle it as a as a footy club? Look, uh, I personally, it is they were they're, they're pretty hard days in that it's um, you know it's it's suck it up, sunshine, and and uh, it's really player support that helps uh, the guy through. And it, it is not easy, and you do your best as a player because you yourself want to keep incredibly positive because you're about to play in it, and and you have to perform mm. and win. But then you've also got this empathy. You've, you've got to support your teammate who's missed out, and uh, it is one of the toughest things. And it's the player support and rallying that helps the guy through. Um, and back in those days, probably not so much the club. There's no such thing as counselling. There's no such thing as uh, yeah, I'll come here, mate, and I'll, I'll talk you through it. It was pretty much, yeah, you're in and you're not. And uh, that was it. it. It was pretty tough, let me tell you, for those guys. Well, it was good that Ambrose got to have uh, premiership success in 98. A- absolutely, and and deserved it thoroughly. And uh, mm. ended up being an incredibly consistent player for us, really consistent. And the thing I love about Kirtley is uh, it's like a lot of players who come here from in the state 
they uh, they think they might hang around for a while and all the rest of it. They just get so engrossed by the footy club and, and what it's about that they love it. And we had a uh, a roast of Roger Delaney and George Fiacci last year. And I'm standing at the bar having a few warm-ups before we went upstairs to have our fun. And I see this head walk around a corner and I'll go, Curtly said, ah, you recognise me, Timmy, because he had a really short haircut. <laughs> and I said, unbelievable. And uh, he said, oh, mate, he said, I would miss a slagging of Delaney and Piazzi for anything. <laughs> <laughs> He's come all the way from WA uh, to, to just enjoy this night. It was hilarious. <laughs> He was a very good footballer, and of course, he won a Sandover medal back in the WA after his time at Port Adelaide. Correct, he did. Went over there and, and played incredibly consistent again. And oh yeah, I, I, I admired his career. And uh, I, I was in Sydney early, and uh, yeah, like a lot of lads, they go, they get drafted and those sorts of things too early, and they're not uh, really ready for it. Mm. And then he. Um, Got his opportunity when he came out in. I think it took him a couple of years to sort of realise what Port Adelaide was about. And he went, oh, I think I might want to get in on this action. This looks pretty good. Because um, he was always a pretty cool dude, always a pretty um, mellow bloke. So he, he got that success, and I'm glad he did. The, well, and the we'll other guy that was, the... I just would you say the other guy that was unlucky to miss out was David Hutton. Yeah. That, that arm uh, basically ended his career. It had yeah. severe foot injuries uh, previously, where yeah. his whole whole uh, skeleton of his left foot, I think it was, all every bone shifted out, and Jeez. that was an horrendous injury. Hutz could never do things uh, <laughs> minor. He always no. made sure that they were major, and he had to miss, you know, 18 games. So poor old Hutz, led with his head too often, and uh, one of the nicest blokes you'll ever meet. But uh, he uh, that ended his, his career, basically, and... And then he started to, um, I reckon, not long after, get into the, the admin side of footy. Yeah, and very yeah, good yeah. too. And brilliant. Great play. Look, we then uh, played Central's in the second semi. We won by two points. We led by as much as 30 late in the game. Um, and we had such a great start that day as well. We, we led five goals, nine to one goal, which yeah. seemed to be a bit of a theme against Central Districts late in that year. Um, I've got the stats here. We actually kicked in the last three games against Centrals. We kicked thirteen goals, twenty-three to one goal four in the first quarters. I, I mean, know. it can't yeah. have been a coincidence that we had a bit of wood over them um, early in games. Yeah, I think that particular season too, they were developed, but they did have this real. Uh, it was a massive gorilla on their back, Port Adelaide, and mm. it was hard for them to shake. And I think they always thought, yeah, they probably had slow starts just worrying about what we were doing rather than what they could do and I know that they used to tag quite a bit I, I used to have uh, me of all people getting tagged um, I used to have Potter come to me quite often and uh, you know try and you know scrag and hold me and all that sort of business and all the rest of it and I used to think yeah come on mate you go and get the ball I'll get the ball see how we go in the middle um, and yeah it was a bit of a different thing because Alan was obviously very conscious of our uh fire starters if you like the guys that started the movement so he mm. was conscious of me stevie williams and blokes that would get the first ball so he, he would often tag us which uh, we just weren't used to it was very very unusual mm. um but yeah so well, I they, they hadn't actually beaten port in a final i think we were seven nil in finals against central districts leading into that granny yeah i, I think you're right and, I, and then i reckon they beat us in the second semi in 96 it was the first time yeah that's right yeah 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 so yeah, so we got that, that particular game, and I suppose reflecting on my own year, um, my wife was pregnant with our first daughter coming along, and uh, we got to the second semi. She was due on the second semi day. And, <laughs> you know, that old adage, what are you going to do, go to the birth or, you know, uh, play the game? I, we didn't know whether it was going to come early, come late, you, you name it. So the day of, the wife's incredibly pregnant, uh, we had the discussion. I said, well, you know, there's absolutely no way in hell I'm not playing. I am playing. <laughs> and she said, of course you're playing. She said, it's a freaking final. <laughs> and, and this, that is a Port Adelaide woman. I, I said, no way. Exactly <laughs> what I would have expected of her, Tim. That she oh, would have actually told you to go and play. She said, what are you talking about? There's not even a discussion. Of course you're playing. 
Did she and, come to uh, the game? She came to the game, which yep, is awesome. Good. And then she went home, and of course, the Sunday morning went and did my normal ritual for training. Uh, went to a barbecue at lunchtime. She started to feel a bit crook, and uh, seven o'clock that night, uh, our first daughter was born. So she was born on the Sunday, which is good discipline, and, and she's been a good girl since. <laughs> so, uh, she, she was born on the Sunday, which was good timing, but what then happened is we had the week in hospital that everybody has, and uh, she comes out on the preliminary final weekend, and of course we, we're brand new parents and you know don't know what we're doing, so we put the baby in the room with us. I got about three minutes sleep for the week, and I'm letting into a grand final <laughs> as captain, and I was yawning at training. I was, you know, uh, almost uh, like a uh, like a stoner because I was walking around just a little bit. <laughs> And then I started yawning, and I saw people looking at me, and I thought they're just going to think I don't give a stuff. Um, but I was—I was incredibly. I had no sleep basically for that whole week. And walking into the game, I thought, "Oh, we'll see how we go." Now, this is this is the the moments that I remember quite distinctly about the game. I've gone out to toss the coin. I've walked into the middle, and uh, Roger Gurdam comes out. And I've known Roger again. He played in that Sapsaza team with Daryl Borlase, myself, Wayne Marnie back in '78. Known him for a long time and respected him. Shook his hand in the middle. The umpire grabbed the coin and they said, well, Timmy, it's Roger's call uh, because I think uh, they finished minor premier or something. I think they did. So anyway, yeah. they get to call. Yeah. And I said, uh, oh, yeah, whatever. So he calls tails. Now, I thought, well, what? I was going to call heads anyway. I always call heads. So the coin goes up, coin goes down. It's tails. That was a pretty stiff breeze going to the uh, northern end. Rogers turned around and said, Beauty, pointed into the wind and took off. I looked at the two umpires. They looked at me. I said, one, I was going to call heads. Two, I was going to kick that way. So it was a freaking waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> said, it was, it was an incredible like decision, was wasn't it? Uh, in my opinion, a huge mistake. It, you know, Macca, you'd already mentioned the fast starts that we'd had against them. Yeah. Why, why would you kick? allow us to try and get another one and I, I always believe and Trent Cochin would learn this lesson you kick with that breeze if you win that toss no matter what you go with it and yeah. I just believe that they, they that their thought process was that not much happens in the first quarter of a grand final because everybody's adrenaline's running and you can go for it but we've played well myself by that stage we've played in about you know six or seven grand finals yeah. well, why give us that and look, we didn't we didn't really take advantage of it. I mean, we kicked three goals seven, which wasn't great. Um, but I knew that straight away. I feel confident about the whole thing. You know, this is a great start. They got to catch us now. It's like batting first. So we came in at. at uh, I remember the, the game distinctly because Jack Cale said to me, "Timmy, um, stay on the ball for about twenty minutes." Now, it, this is only twenty years ago. A bloke doesn't stay on the ball for two minutes. These days, before he's highly <laughs> rotated, he says, "Stay on the ball for twenty, play a kick behind, you know, dictate terms, all the rest of it." I said, "Oh yeah, whatever." So I go off the ball because at that twenty minute marks, he told me I was allowed it. So I go off the ball. I think I swap with Stephen Williams, and they run the ball down, and have a shot at goal, kick a point. Arnfield runs straight for me and has an absolute fit at me and said, "Who told you you could come off the ball? You get back on the ball." Don't you dare come off until you're told. So I get back on the ball. Do you know when I came off the ball? The 26-minute mark of the last quarter. Only because I wanted to kick the goal. I was, it was, I was unbelievable. Born. I was not allowed to come off the ball. Isn't that amazing in 20 years how it's changed? Well, I reckon that I there would have been, what, 10 interchanges in that game? I, was, I watched it again in preparation yeah. for this. And I think Darren Mead rucked the first two and a half quarters almost unchanged. And then when he got he got snotted by John Abbott and then then Pulley came on and, and rucked a big chunk of the game and Meadie might have got a run right at the end. But gee, the, you look at the, the interchanges now and it, it just hardly happened. I mean Jack Jack never liked you even using reserves back in the back in the day because he his view was well I picked the side, this is how I wanted them to line up. I'm not going to change it. 
because this is a side I believe will win. But even in the days of interchange, you go back now and you think back then we probably thought oh, that's quite a few interchanges. And now you look at it and you think, when's it happening? Would someone coming yeah. off? Uh, I mean, Richard phenomenal. Foster came on the ground with about 30 seconds left. Yeah. <laughs> and that was that was his run for the grand final. Yeah. That is, that is very correct. And, and actually made up his mind to say that, uh, I think I'm finished, Timmy. I think I'm finished. He said, uh, <laughs> I think the old boy lost confidence in me. I, I think I'm, uh, I'm over. So he retired at the end of that year. But I, uh, that third quarter, um, I, I was just incredibly exhausted at, at the end of that. Uh, and I, I knew that, you know, your, your sec wins up, especially in the third quarter. But I just can't remember ever working as hard in, in a third quarter of my life. And after the game, I actually felt quite, uh, ill and you know, uh, I was obviously dehydrated and all the rest of it, and I didn't, uh, I didn't feel that well until at least my tenth or eleventh beer. So, <laughs> <laughs> and you had no sleep. Oh well, that, I'll leave that to you three. <laughs> you were so. I think good you had that. fourteen touches in that third well, look, quarter. Epic. Yeah, I, yeah, and uh, I, I think my greatest compliment then, I played in a charity tennis game at the end of that year. And it was a pro-am thing. And the great man, Russell Ebert, playing. And Barry Robin is a part of the day. And my team plays against Barry Robin's team. And we're having a chat. And he said, oh, Timmy, I was really disappointed in, um, in Central's efforts. And I said, uh, in, in what way? And he just said, oh, you know, they, they just didn't take it up to you. Uh, they didn't do this. And he said, and some of their bigger guys were just uh, had no impact. And they were bullied. And uh, by you guys, and uh, he said, you know, I was particularly disappointed with Ingerson, Conway, uh, Lures. Um, it just just wasn't good enough. And um, and and he made the comments, and I, I've said, oh, yeah, okay. And he said another thing. He said, um, who picks that uh, Jack Odie medal? And I said, uh, tell you the truth, I don't, I don't, I don't have a clue. I don't know who picks it. He said, well, they got it wrong. He said, you were best on ground. I said, can you just speak into this recorder, please? <laughs> <laughs> Barry Robert has said, I was best on ground, and I have taken that to the grave. I let everybody know, don't worry about that. I told everybody. <laughs> but when I watch the game back, yeah, he might have had shit in his eyes. Darcy was pretty good. Darcy <laughs> was pretty good. But, but you were, I mean, you know, seeing as your guest, our guest and all, but... Um, you did have a fantastic game, and I know the, in the advertiser on the Monday they gave you best on ground as well. And I think, well, I think Das had I think thirty-seven touches, kicked two goals, and you had thirty-four touches, kicked the last goal of the game. And and even in the commentary during the game, uh, you were just in and under, and that you were well and truly noticed by by the Central's cheer squad commentary team of Neville Roberts and Stephen Trigg and David <laughs> McKay, and even they acknowledged. Your efforts. So I think um, I think Barry. Uh, I think he probably had a pretty good idea of what was going on. Yeah. We were fortunate to, to play in a lot of grand finals, and you always have every intention to play well. Sometimes you just aren't going to be able to contribute as much or get thirty-four touches. But if you get twenty-two, you make sure they're really good touches and make mm. sure that they're really impactful in the game or whatever it may be and all the other things that you have to do in the game. I, I, you know, Andy Obs was never a prolific winner of the footy, but he had games where he was clearly best and you'd look at his stats and you see, geez, that's not really high numbers, but he was best because yeah. of his impact mm. with his touches, you know, and, and I just think it, it's, it's typical that oh, I might have had a good day that day, but it might be Stephen Williams in another game or, uh, you know, Ron Smith or... You know, it's, it's always somebody's going to have the, the day, but we've all got to contribute, and everybody does in grand finals. It, you've got to play your part. Otherwise, you don't win them. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. I thought there was three key moments in that game which uh, led to Port's uh, victory. I think the first turning point was Michael Wakeling got a 25-metre a penalty and missed, um, hit the post from the top of the square in the second quarter, which would have put them in front for the first time or the only time of the game, and, and I thought that was a pretty key moment going into half-time. The second one was, uh, we've already spoken about a little bit, uh, Brian Lees and Scott Stevens' head clash, and whilst Stevens was going off the ground on a stretcher, um, you know, 30 seconds later, Brian Lees courageously backs back into a pack, cops another big hit, and that actually led to a goal to Anthony Darcy. 
And the third turning point, obviously, was John Abbott deciding to, to whack Darren Mead in the face. I mean, the last <laughs> thing you want to do in a big final is piss off Port Adelaide. Well, the, yeah. the Mead one was, not only did he did he whack him in the head, it basically cost them a goal because Smitty got the ball and then, and just to rub salt to the wound, he gave it to Stephen Carter, who then converted the set shot for a goal. So yeah. it was it was not only cost them a goal, it was a real rub your face in the dirt kind of goal. Because Carts, you know, hardly ever kicked goals, but but there he was getting one. And with the lazy one with Scott Stevens, I remember speaking to Brian after the game, or up in the at the club rooms afterwards, and he was pretty merry by then, as, as Tim would imagine. And um, oh. he said we we both went in. He said we just hit heads, and he said no, oh, I just I just blacked out for a minute, and my, everything was buzzing, and I. I looked over and saw him laying there, and I sat up, and he stayed down. And I thought, "Beauty, I'm okay." And he jumped up, and he said, "Off I went." And, and um, <laughs> Scott Stevens wound up being stretched off. I think those three moments, Macca, that you're talking about, is the difference between experience and, and non-experience. It was their first, and like yep. I said, for a lot of us, probably our fifth or sixth uh, experience on the big day, and, and it really it, it shone out. And those moments are great moments of, of saying that. And see, Brian uh, Lee's forever in debt to the Port Adelaide Football Club. Uh, he that those moments he, he just knows if he doesn't, he's going to get talked to by Delaney, Northeast, Viachi mm. back there. They're just going to tell him, "Why didn't you back back? Why didn't you go in? Why didn't you do that?" You know, those expectations were just met for the whole year, and he was never not going to commit his body. And, and I thought he was. Terrific, and I've never seen a man celebrate as much as mine. <laughs> and uh, I'm telling you, at times I had to pull his head in badly because <laughs> he was out of control. He was a little bit untidy by midnight. Very loose, Brian. Very <laughs> loose. <laughs> his white shirt was a little bit scrappy. Oh, we had some characters, but I tell you, that man, he got out of control. Uh, <laughs> North, North East, I just I used to just, just stay away from the tornado. Just stay away from it. So, uh, North, just, he just loved getting... He just wanted to put his duffel coat on, get back in the gym, straight <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> Love him. Boy, it changed the course of the game because we kicked five goals in about six minutes after that, and it was just game over at three-quarter time. And, and I always talk about, when I go and talk to amateur clubs or country clubs or whatever, I always talk about in finals, there's always a tipping point in the game. It's going to be something. Somebody's going to break because finals are, you know, traditionally, you know, two Rams button heads, mm. and just one of them's going to have to, one of them's got to give. And you, I always used to feel those moments through experience. This is the time to up the ante, up the ante, go harder, get more uh, physical, all those sorts of things to just put that pressure on to go. Oh, we just can't keep calm with these blokes. We just don't know how to. And they're crucial points. And that third quarter, you're spot on. I reckon there's just took us probably to, what, 17, 18, 19 minute mark before that happened, uh, before the, 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 the goals flowed, because it's going to take time to, to beat your opposition. That's what it's about. It's just about persistence beating that resistance. Michael Wilson, who he takes the year off to get fit, comes back, does a pre-season, and I think he played just about every game. I don't know that he missed one in that particular year. And he was just outstanding. I, I just thought, this kid's just got so much heart. Um, he's going to be a very important player for us if we make the uh, the AFL, which he did and was. Incredible. It really clean hands, didn't he? It was something that always stood out. Was He just one grabbed everything. Yeah, he had a pretty good physique for a, a, a young 20-year-old. Yeah. And he was mm. strong, straight through the line of it, ran hard and then kicked long, and he did that his whole career. Uh, and pretty cheeky bump, too, like, even as a young fellow. He cleaned up Scott Stevens early in that game. Big, big bump out on the out on the wing, yeah. and just you know made his presence felt. And you thought, gee, that's 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 a pretty uh, strong effort from such a young kid. Yeah, spot on. And uh, yeah, no, he was, he was really good, really good lad too. And big was he's had a, he had a terrific career for Port Adelaide at SNFL and AFL level. Just amazing. Well, last quarter was uh, pretty much party time. I think Central's kicked the first goal of the last quarter through Ray wins a bit. I think the sealer was uh, pretty much straight after when Malakellis uh, gold straight from the bounce down, and that mm. seemed to really take the wind out of Central sails. Yeah, uh, you're right, and I think pretty much then 
when you see George Fiacci <laughs> around half forward, you know that uh, pretty much the game's over, and he uh, is just trying to sneak down and kick goals. And he's an incredibly uh, enigma. Now, uh, I think, Ron, you were alluding to it earlier. He's tried to run down once again, and, and the Ruckman tried to block his run. And George wasn't fond of that. And he uh, whacked him. And Damien Arnold went down to the ground. Then George has continued running. And then he's been accosted by another player. And then another come in. And I sort of looked around and went, ah, oh, do I have to go over? Like, I'm not far away. But George has got about four blocks. On him, whacking it, whacking him. I thought, oh well, better get over there. So we've all gone over there and had a nice old punch on, and and that was terrific news. But <laughs> he, he, he got back of his feet, he went back, and then the very next chance he got, off he went again and started running again down the forward line trying to get a goal. And I, 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 I think he must have been concussed from the fight because it's very late in the game, and I'm coming through centre half forward. He's grabbed it. He's looked at goal, he's feigned, he's come back in, and he handballed to me. And I've had a shot and kicked it. And I'm positive he must have been concussed. Because there's no <laughs> way ever inside 50 would he handball. I then ran around, and of course he's gone back to the back line, and I've used all my effort to get to him and gave him a big kiss on the cheek. And uh, he started laughing start laughing and that's when you know you're uh, having party time and it's a great moment in a grand final when you know you've won because then you really get the crowd involved too and there's probably a moment you would have seen where Brian Lee shakes the ball at the crowd and the yeah. crowd goes off in the outer uh, they're, they're the, the great moments when you can actually enjoy that couple of minutes on the field where you know you've got it yeah. it must have been like a great feeling for Greg Anderson because he'd, he'd been playing since 84, 83, I think Greg started. Same uh, would have been same year as, as you started, Tim. And he yeah, he'd never played in a premiership. No, and just left before we had our run of three in a row. Yeah. And uh, I came back to the Crows, didn't play in those early 90s flags. And then um, comes this day. Now, I've known Greg since I was 10 years of age. We played in all those sort of uh, junior stuff together. Um, through the junior support into the league together and it was one of those moments where, where when he came back and he started playing with us rather than the Crows I said you know what and George used to tease him as well he said you got a lot of medals Ando but you haven't got one of these have you and he used to wave the championship <laughs> uh, typical George and uh, I said to him I said no I'm looking it was a really um, it was one of my I suppose nicer moments in, in the aftermatch of 95, just being able to uh, embrace him, give him a big hug, and the, all the emotion came out of him because he knew, he was, I can't go through my whole career without winning the flag, and it was just awesome that he could get 95 and 96 under his belt. Talking about best players, obviously uh, Darcy won the Jack Odie medal, a huge game. Timmy, you were probably equal best on ground. You had a bloody fantastic game as well. I actually thought the half-back line was... Just about unpassable that day. I mean, Stephen Carter, Brian Lees, and Paul Northeast. Ron Smith wrong. had a ripper grand final as well, and Tony Malakellis had a had another great grand final. And I feel that Tony Malakellis is a player that sort of gets lost a little bit in that era. He had a he had three brilliant seasons at Port Adelaide. Mm. He actually added, especially in '94, he added the leg speed that we just didn't have, and uh, he was he was particularly um, brilliant for us and, and his pace and explosiveness and being able to kick goals was just excellent. Rowan became an incredibly consistent player through those middle 90s and you know went up on the wing and just became this uh, ball magnet. And, of course, a ball in Rowan Smith's hands is always going to hit the next target because um, mm -hmm. he was just so skillful. He was way ahead of his time in that, in that space. So, yeah, you did right. Those two guys had good year. But, you know, Robbie West won our best and fairest and... Uh, he was outstanding, and in the final, he was closely followed. He, he had uh, he had somebody following him around. Tag yeah, Green, but, uh, David Green, David Green. Yeah, that's right. Green used to be a really hard yeah. tagger, and uh, yeah. So it probably again, you don't have massive numbers, but it doesn't matter. 
it, he's won the best and fairest. He's played in the Premiership and you know, he's been an incredible contributor to us and played his part in on the day just by not giving up and just uh, doing what you can when you can. So really important. And the, I think the guy that got overlooked a bit, um, I was just reading a, reports on the game um, preparation for this and um, Darren Mead, I thought, was fantastic. I mean, up until when he got snotted and he yep. and then he came off for quite a spell, but he didn't have a lot of hit outs. But he his competitiveness at the bounces against the you know the much taller Arnold was just fantastic. He nullified him, and I think Tim, you would have obviously been right under the the feet there seeing it happen. But his his game around the ground, I think he had to the point he went off. He'd had about twenty touches to halfway through the third quarter. You know, ten kicks, ten mar- <laughs> ten handballs, probably took around ten marks. And I, I thought he was really influential, and, and especially dropping that kick behind the play, that classic Port Ruckman style of um, shoring up that defence. And, I mean, in the end of the day, Central's only kicked six goals in the grand final, and he was a, a strong part of that, and certainly Pulley carried that on when he came on. But I thought Meaty, for that, uh, his influence on the game at the early stages was really strong. Uh, you're dead right, but Meaty, uh, just like... Brett Chalmers and Daryl Poole in other grand finals, they were like another midfielder for us. So mm. they were incredibly competitive, you know, in the centre square and around the ground in the, in the ruck contest to just make sure that we got a, uh, a contest out of it. Um, but then they were like another midfielder. And they, you know, especially Meaty, incredible leap. Mid, uh, you know, could certainly run quicker than me, but that's nothing to brag about. But, you know, could run away with pace and tackle people down and just act like another, you know, midfield. It was just, it was a real bonus having those type players once the ball was in play. They were just like another ruck rover. You know, it was mm-hmm. it was very, very handy. And I, in the, my latter years, Jack just told me to play kick behind rather than go like a rover and chase it around like a madman. He just said, play kick behind and read everything and just stay in and around where the, the ruckman uh, sits back and just clean up and mop up with them. Oh, jeez. I said, how long's this been going on? I could have, been, I could have put another 10 years on my career. <laughs> what, a, what a role. Unbelievable. Well, it was a, it was a wonderful premiership, but I, I don't think it would be uh, right to not mention the uh, the horrible postscript uh, to the 95 season, which is, of course, Robbie West um, getting bashed in Victor Harbour and ending up in a coma and almost losing his life. Uh, yeah, look, it happened in pre-season of 96 uh, when we went to Victor Harbour for our normal pre-season camp. And uh, that particular evening, it was a sort of, again, clockwork for us. We, we'd get there on the Friday, compete really hard on the Friday night, um, get an early night because we were up very early to run around Granite Island and off goes the, the day's activities which were always really hard but Saturday night Jack always let us uh, go to the Crown or the Victor Hotel to let our hair down we always had a curfew and that was about it and unfortunately uh, not being there or seeing anything uh, and and, uh, the attack on him was absolutely brutal and unnecessary and you know it was just such a tragedy I I got woken up by Darren McKay who'd come screaming in to the dorm saying, Robbie's been bashed, Robbie's been bashed. Now I'm half asleep and very tired from the day's activities and I've jumped out of bed thinking he's being attacked out the front of the dorms. So I've run out the dorms in my jocks thinking we're, we're fighting. And, of course, they've gone, no, 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 he's gone. He's been airlifted. And I'm there, jeez, what happened, you know? And, of course, you try to piece everything together and it was, it was an absolute nightmare. And, unfortunately, you know, it changes a young man's life forever. And, you know, uh, that was just completely unnecessary we catch up we see him now and again over in perth and uh you know he's married kylie and had some kids and all that sort of thing so you know he's living a terrific life but nowhere you know his his footy career was robbed short i'm not sure if he was able to play in 96 he would have played well again and would have been in that first afl squad i reckon yeah i I remember sort of hearing on the news that a player had had been bashed and, and was in a coma and you think, oh, that's that's terrible. And then um, a mate of mine called me and said, it's it's Robbie West, and I just couldn't believe it. You know, it's he, he was, uh, you know, I don't know how, how your thought processes go, but you know, he's such a such a happy-go-lucky guy on the field, and and uh, you know, a bit of a cheeky larrikin, and 
and then to just hear the the whole story of what happened and and just yes, as Tim said, just how vicious the assault was, and it it was just awful, terrible. I mean, it's terrible to hear about happen any young man, but you you always feel a bit of an association with the footballers. You know, you watch them play every week, and if you're lucky, you might know a few. And it's um, yeah, it, it was just um, devastating. Spot on, and uh, yeah, yeah. Um, really, really unnecessary, and, and you're right. Sort of put a really big dampener on, yeah, the, the beginning of of '96 season. No doubt about that. Mm. And as you said, he, he probably would have played in the AFL side. Yeah, I think he would have made that squad. Yeah, I don't think he, he had all the leg speed, all the power, and everything yeah. that uh, you need. And I think he would have, uh, you know, made it quite easily. Um, so yeah, but anyway, that'll, that'll be our uh, discussion next year when we're talking about '96. Mm. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> on a, on a less like somber note, could, I you do think it, Lizzie was unlucky. There's so many themes that we can run. Yeah, that's it. That's it. And uh, <laughs> I think uh, I might have been '95 when I went to the chimney, and uh, I got up at the ceremony and said, "Gee, it's like Christmas, isn't it? it only comes once a year." <laughs> <laughs> that was very unnecessary. That was naughty. That was naughty, mate. <laughs> Love it. Well, we might leave right, it there boys. for now. It's been a uh, been a monster. Thank you so much for coming on, Tim. Yeah, it's been fantastic. Thanks, Thanks Tim. Nah, really enjoy it. Thanks, guys, and uh, really appreciate it. And uh, it's it's great to reflect back twenty years and and the, and the and the messages that come out of these chats are the messages that get forward on through history for Port Adelaide because it's it's the principles that remain the same, my friends. How hey, quickly, Tim, uh, how's the corporate sales going? Oh, yes, in, in, entertaining indeed. Uh, it's got, there's going to be a, a, an announcement soon for another uh, premier partner, which is just underneath uh, uh, EA, you know, Energy Australia and Renault, so that's that's really important for us because we need to get a, a couple in there and and hopefully soon in a week's time we might be able to announce another one. So it'll be a couple in, in succession. Ooh. So that that's really important to us building that that sort of top end while our hospitality uh, advertising partners uh, sponsorship uh, the Magpie stuff that because I'm also doing that uh, we have got. All bar one sponsored to uh, re-sign and actually got uh, a couple of others interested in doing uh, some stuff with the Maggie. So it's it's really healthy at the moment. Um, and right through the footy club, I'm dealing uh, with Russell Ebert as well, where I'm trying to get some support for uh, the community programs that he runs and uh, looking to get some stuff for our um, Aboriginal Academy that uh, is uh, headed up by Eugene Warrior as well. So, yeah, we're um, we're out there shopping around, my friend, and, and working really hard, but enjoying every minute of it because really our our big season is the off season to make sure that everything's ready by that first bounce. So, we're uh, so what about ticket? What about corporate hard. corporate ticket sales going strong for games? As, as boxes for games. Oh yes, and I, can I tell you if you want to go to the Anzac game, do not. Dally. Do not dilly dally. The, the Antec game, unbelievable interest in that. Um, and lots and lots and lots of uh, ticketing being bought casually and obviously people who want seasonal, but the casual stuff for that particular game is at a premium at the moment. Good choice. Well, what Port Adelaide have always done well, isn't it, Tim? And I go right back to you know my my time back in the, the 80s as a supporter and, and onwards is, is engage with its supporter base. I mean the the nights up at you know up in the the rooms or up in the the big room in the Quinn stand um, after a game and and the players just mingling with everyone and and just talking to supporters and getting their feedback and as you said getting the pressure put on them and uh, it, it's it's what I, I don't know if it, it's unique because I don't know what other clubs do but it certainly is a, is one of the, the real strong points of Port Adelaide is that engagement and the, the, the players have always had the, let the supporters you know be at their level basically and never looked down on them and, and always spoken to them and and been terrifically engaging with them yeah I think there's times that we probably lost our way uh, through our AFL journey on that on that note but I mm. reckon uh, that is well and truly back in the fold 
and very important that it's back in the in the in vogue because it's one of the things that uh, you know you'd hear blokes like Paul North East always get up and say you know we're family at Port Adelaide we're yeah. family and yeah. they're dead, dead right you know you, and and that's the feeling that everybody got and it's so important because we are a community grassroots football club who's elevated itself to the AFL but you don't lose your you don't lose your principles and that's what I keep harping on you don't lose your principles and the way you behave because uh, that's important to being successful and part of that is in the embracement of your of your your members your supporters your people your community it's so important and we've uh, really well and truly got back onto that that page yeah it's been great Excellent. All, right, all right boys thank you very much thank Go you wow. here he is like that if it's not running, it's dispatching a quick handball, a reflex from the pack. Stephen Williams does equally well to Malakellis. Dodging and weaving, a little bit of shadow boxing, gets it away to West. This is where he hurts. He gets in front, he gets inside of 50, has a look at the goals and finishes it off. He can play Robbie West. And at the 13...